guess we should move on to the next part of the uh, disclosures that we've seen so far. And that concerns the GPU. Now, we should expect to see some significant advances here because we're moving from 36 compute units to 60, um, which is you know, obviously a pretty big <laughs> improvement in terms of raw compute power. We're also seeing uh, big improvements to memory bandwidth, circa 25%, which I think is excellent. Um, there's also, well, when you look at the teraflop numbers, we need to talk about teraflops really because this is a bit of a bone of contention because obviously the PlayStation 5 um, had about 10.23 teraflops, I believe, uh, based on the RDNA2 architecture. Now, Sony is actually disclosing here that there's 33.5 teraflops um, with PlayStation 5 Pro, which, you know, looks amazing, right? It looks like a threefold increase. However... Uh, that's not really the way you can't really expect three times performance and actually sony is saying that we should expect more like 45 percent of extra performance if you just use existing games i guess alex do you want to talk about dual issue fp32 because it seems to distort teraflops somewhat significantly yeah we saw this in the pc space between rdna2 and rdna3 as well as between turing and ampere so Ampere did something interesting where it did con concurrent int operations as well. And that was an interesting, uh, I don't know, evolution that they, they immediately backtracked on uh, with Ampere. <laughs> Uh, I don't know why, but they did. Uh, and they brought out this dual issue F FP32 architecture, which uh, in practice highly inflated, like what we're seeing here, the theoretical teraflops performance of the GPU versus its peers in like the same class from different architectures, um, earlier architectures. But in terms of gameplay performance, it really did not actually, um, I would say, move the needle in a way that was like doubling of some very large portion of the overall frame time of an entire game. Because obviously this does have an effect. But um, there are other, so technically things can run two times as fast, but an entire frame is made up of so many different processes, which are waiting on one another and scheduling, and they're reliant on things like how much cash is there? Is the cash full? Is the cash been cleared? Uh, how much bandwidth is there in this very one moment? Are we moving things from here to there? There's a lot of other things in a GPU other than it's just raw compute performance that um, say actually whether or not it'll perform X amount better than some competing architecture doing some certain task. It's a bit wishy-washy way to say that this actually, the, you shouldn't really look at the teraflop number here because we've seen this exact same thing coming, happening in the PC space over two different architectures. And it led to uh, strange results of scaling where you look at things, I think it's like the 6700 and like the 7700 if I'm not yeah. mistaken, on the RDNA 2 to RDNA 3 side. And they have like wildly different teraflops numbers. But if you look at their performance, you would never think that uh, in titles, like being benchmarked across titles. So um, this is just a nice little bonus that will make certain aspects of the GPU faster. But in terms of the overall frame time, um, there's other aspects to be considered. Yeah, I guess we can also look at ROG Ally as an example yet again, yeah. because it too has dual <laughs> issue FP32. And it's like an eight teraflop it's, yeah, machine. Yeah. It's like in, on paper, it's supposed to be like twice as fast as a PS4 Pro if you if you were to yeah. believe those numbers, but obviously... Or an Xbox Series S. Yeah, for that yeah, matter. <laughs> that's not realized in practice in the slightest. So. <laughs> uh, anything to add to that, Oliver, about you know this whole situation with the GPU? I mean, you... Mm. Plus forty five percent of performance uplift from going from uh, uh, thirty six compute units to sixty isn't fantastic, really, but it is kind of believable. It is very plausible. I think that basically you have sixty CUs relative to thirty six. Yeah. I think that's sixty seven percent more CUs. We don't know the clock speed. I don't think. Um, and on the balance side, you get a 28% uplift, I believe, with moving from 14 gig gigatransfers per second memory to 18. And then when you look at the PS4 Pro, you know, that had, I, I looked at the figures, that had 24% faster memory, and then um, about, I think, about 2.3 times faster uh, on the flop number. So, like, on paper, this seems less impressive. But if you dive into the other aspects of the spec sheet, 
it actually does seem like this is uh, more impressive than it initially seems. That 45% figure that's being provided to developers is maybe not indicative of the true power of the system when you think about it holistically. But if you're just yeah. running the same workloads, it's it's uh, it's a pretty meager uplift for a pro console, I would say. Right. Yeah, I mean, people have reverse engineered the teraflops to give us a clock speed number, and that right. clock speed number is 2.18 gigahertz, which is actually slower than PlayStation 5's 2.23. Now, obviously, the boost clock situation and the wattage limit may play a, a part in how much clock speed you're actually getting out of the 5 uh, versus the 5 Pro. Um, but yeah, that's certainly interesting. Um, what else can we say about the GPU? I mean, it's it's obviously a much bigger chip. Um, it's, it's weird that it's running at a slightly lower clock. I'm wondering yeah. if there's going to be compatibility reasons, uh, sorry, compatibility issues, or whether it just clocks up back to where it should do and just deactivate CUs uh, <sighs> when it's in PlayStation 5 back compat mode. That's going to be quite interesting to see. And from there, of course, you know, just basically what's going to happen with backwards compatibility in general. Will it run just like a PlayStation 5? Or will there be some kind of optional boost mode similar to the to the 4 Pro there? One thing that I actually think is kind of interesting about the potential of it being a much wider GPU with potentially a lower clock speed than the original PlayStation 5 is that it actually, if you go back to uh, Mark Cerny's original presentation on the PlayStation 5, uh, it is almost counterintuitive to the philosophy of that he put forward for the PlayStation 5 GPU of it being narrow and highly clocked. Um, uh, in this case, it would be very wide, but like mediocrely clocked. It's wider, <laughs> you know, like I think relative to the Xbox Series X, it's like right around there. Um, and I think this could be, it could be two reasons for this. One is this, the obvious one in the room. It's the wattage thing again. Like it's just butting in the way and it limits essentially what they can do. Um, but also the fact that, uh, mid gen games are very different than early gen games because there's the transition over to using more compute and less, I would say, just older techniques. Uh, that defined cross-gen games, which were essentially higher resolution of the old stuff. Um, and I think as developers move towards more cross-gen titles that are using more things like GI, ray tracing, interesting simulations that require a lot of compute, the Xboxes, or even mesh shaders, the Xboxes architecture has proven itself in the last couple of titles, I think at least that Oliver's looked at, uh, to being a pretty great performer vis-a-vis -vis the PlayStation 5. And maybe this, um, the PlayStation 5 Pro, is also like the Series X geared towards a later gen, um, I don't know, different workload that the GPU has to contend with. Yeah, I also just think like they're really butting up against whatever power constraints are supposed to be evident for consoles. Because like when you look at comparable AMD GPUs, they are in the region of about 250 watts, like an RX 6700 or 6800 rather, or um, a 7700 XT. So My I goodness. think I think there is a good chance. I mean, almost an overwhelming chance, especially if this is on six nanometers, that this is the most power hungry console ever made. More wattage than a launch <laughs> PS4 or PS3 rather. Oh so, my goodness! Yeah, yeah. I think I think this thing might be a bit of a chonker in the region of. <laughs> I'd be surprised if it's in the region of 300 watts is a number I would think of. Uh, maybe a little short oh, of that, I love but it. but certainly probably in contention for that given the mooted specs here. So I think it would be a bit of a console that's unlike consoles as we know them currently, at least in terms of its thermal configuration. Yeah, that's an interesting point. Again, 4 Pro went from uh, 28 nanometer on the base machine to 16 nanometer on the Pro machine. And then as a bonus, you got a slim machine that, you know, was, was really efficient and quiet. Yeah. Um, now the issue is that it really does look as though we're on a similar process load. And we've already seen the slim console and, and there it is back there. It's not actually that much slimmer and it looks as though the power uh, reduction is in the region of 10 to 20 percent based on uh, some tests that i've seen comparing uh, the five sorry the six nanometer chip to the uh, launch seven nanometer so yes it does kind of suggest that it is going to be consuming a lot more power uh, in order to service those 60 compute units uh, so yeah i am going to be interested to see the form factor 
<laughs> it's going to be fascinating to see that. That said, I think, you know, over the generations, you know, because there's been like four different uh, PlayStation 5s at this point, they have successfully reduced the size of the heatsink each time, even before they did the process shrink. So maybe a machine that's more in line with the size of the original PlayStation 5, possibly slightly larger. That's likely the way forward, possibly. Just have to see this thing, really. Um, I think overall, though, I mean, uh, what's happening here is that Sony has kind of um, uh, done the best they could with the existing cost efficient sort of process uh, that's available to them, which is seemingly uh, six nanometer. If it's five nanometer, then things, you know, become even more interesting at that point, which is like, why are we getting these limited clocks? It should be doing a lot better than that. Um, so, yeah, interesting stuff. But the other thing, of course, is that um, 4 Pro was essentially like a um, the GPU was essentially a butterfly image of the original GPU. It yeah. basically doubled the amount of compute units. We're not doubling the CUs at this point. And that's likely because we don't have that meaningful process shrink. And on top of that, um, you know, the cost per transistor is such that, you know, it would be a very machine, a very expensive machine to produce if they did do that. So, yeah, that's probably why we're seeing a more, how can I say it, NVIDIA-like approach, which is to say that, hey, we can't just throw transistors at the problem anymore to get more performance. We actually need to have uh, better solutions here. 